Hi. Uh, is this guy? Yeah. Uh, so I will be talking about how we serve deep learning model predictions at Booking.com. And before I start, I would like to give a brief introduction about myself. Uh, so I would like to tell you what I am and what I'm not so that we have a better understanding of each other to meet the expectations. So I'm a backend developer working on uh, developing the infrastructure for uh, deploying the deep learning models at Booking.com. And I'm also a machine learning enthusiast, so both of these things just uh, uh, match, match well for me. And I'm also a big uh, open source fan, and I'm a contributor in a couple of projects like uh, Git tool that uh, probably most of you have uh, used already. And I'm contributor in Pandas library as well as uh, Kinto by Mozilla, and uh, Go GitHub project by Google, and a bunch of other projects. And uh, I'm also a tech speaker. So. Let me talk about what I'm not so that we have the expectations at the same level. I'm not a data scientist, and I'm not a machine learning expert. So if you have some specific questions about uh, how things work from a data scientist point of view and really about something uh, related to deep learning or machine learning, I might not have the uh, uh, best answers right now. But I will be able to point you to, to where you can find the answer, or we can talk about that after, uh, after my talk. So let me start with the agenda, what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to start with uh, mentioning a couple of uh, applications of deep learning that we saw at Booking.com. And uh, then I will talk about the life cycle of a deep learning model from a data scientist's point of view, uh, like how this uh, model looks like and what are the different uh, stages of, uh, of a deep learning model. And next, I will talk about the deep learning production pipeline that we have, that we have built. Uh, on the top of containers and Kubernetes, and yeah, let's begin. So starting with the applications of deep learning at Booking.com. The first application that we saw at Booking.com, uh, so, so before I talk about the applications, I would like to talk about the scale, because I mentioned like the, we work at a huge, uh, at a large scale. We have over 1.2 million uh, room nights reserved every 24 hours. And these, pro these reservations come from more than 1.3 million properties, which are in across 220 countries. So we have this large scale, and this is provides us uh, access to a huge amount of data that we can utilize to improve the customer experience of our users. So the first application that we saw at Booking.com was image tagging. The question here is, what do we see in a particular image? Like, for example, if you see this image, what do we see in this image? And this is a really easy question, as well as a difficult one. So if you ask this question to a person, to a human, it's easy because we know when we look at an image, we can identify the images, uh, the objects in the image. And this is easy for a human. But when we talk about this question being answered by artificial intelligence, by machine learning or deep learning, it's not a very easy one. So for example, if we pass this image to to some publicly available model, uh, like ImageNet or some, something else, this is what we get. We get results like, um, so there are different classes, oceanfront, nature, uh, building, penthouse, apartment, and all this stuff. But when we ask this question that what is there in that image, it really depends what context we are talking about. From booking point of view, this is what we are concerned about. We are concerned about whether there is a sea view from the room or not, whether uh, this, this photo is of a bed or not, if it's a photo of uh, into, uh, inside a room or not, or whether there's a balcony or terrace. So there are a couple of challenges associated with uh, this type of problems. First of, uh, first of all, there, this problem is not just an image classification. It's image tagging. That means that there may be multiple, uh, multiple labels, multiple classes for a particular image. And also, since our context is different from what other uh, publicly available models may provide, we need to make sure that we come up with our own manual uh, labels so that we can tag these images. And the next challenge is there is going to be a hierarchy of the labels. For example, if we see a photo of a bed, it may be of a, So we know that if, a, if there is a bed in the photo, it, the photo will be of in, inside view of a room. Unless you are in such a room where there is no room, uh, there is no room, but there is only bed. 
Um, so yeah, once we know that what is there in an image, we can use this information to improve the experience of the users. For example, if we know that a user is looking for a swimming pool in the property that they're going to book, we can show them, uh, uh, recommend or show them the hotel which we know that if there is a swimming pool, there is some photo which is tagged with swimming pool. Or similarly, if we, if we know that there, are, there is some customer, based on previous history, that there is some customer uh, th that is looking for breakfast buffet, we can show the ho uh, hotels or properties which we know th uh, have some photos tagged with breakfast buffet. So this way we can make sure that we are improving the experience of the customers and helping them um, find the hotels or properties that they want easily and quickly. Uh, another uh, application that we saw uh, was um, recommendation system. So this is a classic uh, rec recommendation problem. We have a user X, they booked a user y, uh, hotel Y. Now we have a new user, user Z. We want to recommend some hotels that the user Z is most, more probable to book. So the problem statement here is we want to find the probability of one user booking a particular hotel. And what features do we have? We have some user features, which are like country and language of the user. And then we have some contextual features, like what's the day of the week when they are looking for it, or uh, what, what's the season that they are looking for it, it's winter, spring, or, or what, what's, the, what's the season. And the next uh, features, set of features we have is item features, the features of the property that we are uh, looking at, like price of the, of the property, or the location of the property, or other information about, uh, about that particular property. So once we realize that there are uh, some set of applications where we could achieve better results using the deep learning, um, we started exploring this field. And uh, th credits to my colleagues, uh, Stas, Gherkin, and uh, uh, Emra, who is a data scientist, uh, who actually started uh, with, uh, with explo exploration of deep learning on different applications. And now we are actually using it in production uh, successfully. So next, let's talk about the life cycle of a model, what it looks like for a particular model from the start of the idea to when it actually is used in the application, in, in your applications, which may be anything. So these are the three steps. Code, train, and deploy. In first step, what we do is, the, this is the step when a data scientist writes a model, when they experiment with the different kind of embeddings, different kind of features, or a different number of uh, um, hidden layers or any, any kind of uh, that, that kind of approach. They test or experiment with different kinds of model architecture. And once they are happy with it, once they uh, see good results, they move, uh, move towards uh, training on, uh, on production data and then they deploy. Uh, at Booking, we use uh, TensorFlow Python API, uh, which is a high level API which provides uh, easy, to, easy to use uh, functions to write a model architecture easily in Python. So when we talk about the production pipeline, these are the two steps that we have in the pi production pipeline that we call it. Training of a model on production data and the deployment in, um, in containers which can be served by any application. So you may wonder why training of a model is a part of a production pipeline. You, you may also use uh, your laptops to train your models, right? But this is why it, uh, it, it's not a good idea. So if you try to train your model on your laptop, this is what you may end up looking like. There are a couple of reasons for that. So one reason is your data may be too large that you can't uh, use your laptop efficiently. Or another reason is that your laptop won't have, like your laptop will, in most of the cases, will have limited resources, will have some limited number of cores, or may not have a very powerful GPU. So there are, these are the reasons where, why you may want to do the testing and experimenting with the model on your laptop. But then when, once you are sure that this is the model you want to go ahead with, it's a good idea to, uh, to use some heavy servers or uh, some specialized servers with GPUs or with uh, a high number of cores so that you can speed up the process and, uh, yeah, and, and speed up the process of deployment when you actually get the model ready. So this is how the training of a model looks like. We use our servers, like we have huge servers which have multiple, a lot of cores and GP, sometimes GPU support as well. We wrap the training, so this is the training script for a particular model, and we run that on a, our huge servers, which are production servers. 
But there are going to be multiple data scientists who are going to train their models. And sometimes there are going to be multiple models being trained in the same, uh, on the same server or multiple servers at the same time. And we may not uh, be able to provide um, independent environment if we do this uh, in this way on a single server. So what we do is we wrap this training inside a container. So what is a container? Container is a lightweight package of the software which uh, you can run on a, on, a, on a host machine. And it includes all the de dependencies that, you, that your application may need. So we wrap this training script inside a, a container. We spawn up a container every time we want to train a model. And also, this provides us easy, uh, easy versioning of the TensorFlow, because we, once we have a particular model written in TensorFlow, let's say 1.1 version, now the new model comes up, and a new data scientist wants to use a new model. We can easily have uh, that new container have the new version and use it. So basically, on the same machine, we are having different versions of the dependencies, and uh, we, that's why we are using containers to make sure that we have these independent uh, environments for all of these trainings. And also, it helps in the GPU support. We can also uh, these uh, containers can also utilize the GPU support on our uh, big servers that we have. So this is how it looks like. Uh, we have this Hadoop storage, where we have all the production data that we want to use for uh, training our models. We spawn up a new container when we want to train. It has a training script. And it fetches the data from uh, the Hadoop storage. It runs the training. Once the training is done, we want to make sure that the model checkpoints, the model weights, are stored somewhere so that we can utilize them later in production when we deploy them. So what we do is we save the model checkpoints back to Hadoop storage, and the container is gone. Yeah, so it's the, what, what can be more selfless than a container? It takes birth to do what you want it to do, and then it dies. So that's the entire life of a container. So once we have uh, this training done, we have trained our model on uh, production data, and we have stored the model checkpoints on Hadoop storage which we can utilize now. Now, deployment is uh, putting that model in production somewhere, in servers or in somewhere, where you can utilize that model to have predictions by your different application that you may have. You may have your web application, or you may have your app, Android, iOS, any app, and you want to make sure that you can utilize those, uh, that, that model from those applications. So what we did was, um, we have a Python app, which is a basic uh, WSGI HTTP server, where you can, which what it does is, it takes the model weights from the container, uh, from the Hadoop storage, and it loads the model in memory. So when we want to load a model, it needs two things. It needs the model definition, as well as the model weights. So we have the model definition already when we have this Python app running, and we get the model weights from the Hadoop storage. We combine these, and we load the model in memory so that it is ready to serve the predictions now. And it, on the top of this, it also provides a nice URL, a nice, easy to use, easy to remember URL to get the predictions. So basically, it all boils down to sending a GET request with all your parameters that you have and getting the prediction back. This is how it looks like. Again, we have uh, this app running in a containerized environment so that it's independent and it carries all the dependencies with itself. And uh, there's no problems like it runs on my machine or it runs on this version of OS. It doesn't run on that version. So it contains all the dependencies that it needs. And it can run on any server where you can run uh, Docker containers. So basically, we use Docker to manage uh, to use the containers thing. So this is how it looks like. We have the containerized uh, serving of a, our model, and we can have any kind of clients which will just send us the input features and get back the predictions. But as I mentioned earlier, we have a huge scale that we operate on. And uh, when we have thousands of requests or millions of requests per second, we can't just have just one server. So what we do is this. We spawn a lot of containers put them in, uh, behind a load balancer, and the client doesn't know how many servers are actually serving. You just send requests to a load balancer IP, and load balancer takes care of, uh, of all the scheduling, uh, all the rerouting the request. 
since we have huge, uh, a huge uh, large scale, we have plenty of more containers. So once we keep on increasing the number of containers that we have for one application, we want a way to be able to manage these containers. Because it's possible that sometimes we want to increase the number of uh, containers, or sometimes we want to decrease the number of containers when we see that there's less traffic, or uh, also we may want to diagnose uh, some of the containers when some, something goes wrong with the containers, or let's say we want to kill some of the containers and spawn them again because there's some error or something. So for, for this, we use uh, Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes is a container orchestration uh, platform which helps us in uh, scheduling, maintaining, and scaling applications using containers. So Kubernetes is a really uh, nice uh, t tool by Google, which provides us a really nice, flexible way to scale up or scale down any application at any time. We can create new instances, new containers, put them behind the same load balancer, and uh, those containers will be now serving the applications, to the request from the clients. Or we can scale down easily with just one command. And also, Kubernetes makes sure that if we mention that we have, want to have 50, let's say, for example, 50 containers for application, it makes sure that even if one of the containers or two of, two of the containers or, let's say, 10 containers die because of some error, it makes sure that an, at any moment, it's going to retry and create new ones so that we don't have to care about if something goes wrong unless there is something seriously wrong and it can't uh, create new containers. So basically, it will try to maintain the number of containers to a particular uh, limit that we have set. So once we know that how we can how we how we deploy the models, we also need to be able to measure the performance of these models in production when we have a lot of requests coming coming in uh, at at a rate of uh, plenty of thousands of requests per second. So this is how it looks like. Let's say you have your model, and it takes some computation time to compute the prediction for a set of features for a set of input features, and. But that, that is not going to be the time that your client is going to see. Your client is going to also have some request overhead because of networking latency, depending on where your app, app is hosted and where your client is coming from. So this is how it looks like. The prediction time total is uh, sum of request overhead and the compute computation time. And if you have n resources, you just uh, uh, if you have n instances you predict on in one request. You just multiply it by computation time, and this is what uh, you get as a as a rough calculation of your prediction time from client side of uh, client point of view. And we can see that if we have some simple models where computation time is uh, like simple models like logistic regression or linear regression, where we have a small set of features and it's a small model, there we will have. Uh, the request overhead will be the bottleneck, and the computation time will, will be almost negligible compared to the request overhead. So once we know this is the kind of uh, performance that we can expect, there may be two things. Either you may want to optimize for latency or throughput. Let's talk about latency. Latency is the amount of time it takes to serve one request. So how can we, uh, so th you may have some applications, like let's say you have a web application which uh, needs to be served as soon as possible, so you want to optimize for latency there. And these are some of the ways that you can use to optimize for latency. The first way is don't predict in real time if you can pre-compute. So this is a simple way when you can pre-compute all the results that you know that are going to be there to predict. You can just save them in the lookup table and uh, serve from that lookup table, and you, you will be really fast. And you won't have any, any computation time in the real time. But we understand that it's not always possible. In, almost all, most of the, in most of the applications, we have uh, uh, the need to predict real time. What we can do there, uh, we could reduce the request overhead. And one of the ways we could do that is uh, we can have the model embedded in the application so that uh, there's no latency in accessing the model and getting the predictions back. So that's what we do as well. We keep the model in, the, in memory in the container that is serving the app, and so that it's able to predict and uh, return the request quickly. Next is predict for one instance. This is useful when you have uh, computation time, which is huge as compared to the request overhead. 
When you know that your computation time is the key, is a, is a bottleneck for your request, you, can, you, should, you should send as many requests as instances you have. So let's say you want to predict for 10 set of instances. You should send 10 requests, because you know that your request overhead is not the, uh, is, is not the bottleneck here, and you don't want to reduce the request overhead. You just want to make sure that you've sent requests as soon as possible and get the results back. And you can also uh, do some techniques like quantization. And what that means is it means you convert your float 32 values to fixed type 8 bits. Uh, and how it helps is that y now your CPU can hold four times more data in the same processor. And hence, uh, it becomes faster in processing that data uh, in computing the float values as compared to the com uh, computing the float values. And there are some TensorFlow-specific techniques like freezing the network. Freezing the network means that um, when, you, when you have some uh, computation graph, what you do is you have some variables, TensorFlow variables. And if you convert those variables into TensorFlow constants, you get some uh, boost in the performance and the speed uh, of the computation of the predictions. And another thing is you can optimize for inference. What that means is you can uh, remove all the unused nodes from the graph, and that will help in, the, in boosting up the computation again. Next is we may want to optimize for, late, uh, for throughput. Throughput means the amount of work being done in one unit time, maybe one second, one minute, depending on what your use case is. If you want to get a lot of work done per unit time, it's, uh, again, the first step, first thing you always is do not pre-compute if you can always have a lookup table with all the computations and use them uh, when your request comes. And another thing you can do is batch the request. When you know that you want maximum amount of done work done in a unit time, you want to reduce the request overhead as, as much as possible. So if you send a lot of requests together in one request, let's say thousands of requests, you are going to get performance boost of those thousand times request overhead, which you don't have now as compared to when you could have send, uh, sent those requests one by one. And you can also send uh, parallelized requests. And you can just use uh, asynchronous request instead of using the uh, uh, instead of waiting for one request response to come back uh, before say, sending another request. You can just send them all in parallel and let the servers do its work and asynchronously collect the responses and uh, make sure that you get maximum done work uh, work done in uh, unit time. So um, let's try to summarize what we talked about. Um, First of all, we talked about training of models in containers. We spawn a new container. It fetches the data from our uh, Hadoop storage. It can be MySQL as well. It depends, really depends on the application. And it runs the training script in an independent environment in a container. It make, once the training is, uh, is complete, make sure that it stores the data, uh, stores the model checkpoints back in the Hadoop storage, and it dies. That's the entire process of the training. Uh, of a model in container. The next is serving these models from containers using Kubernetes. We spawn as many containers as possible, a a as we need, depending on how many requests we have for that particular application. And we let the Kubernetes do its stuff with the load balancing as well as uh, maintaining and managing the containers and providing us easy interface to, to diagnose uh, all, all the problems that we may have. And the next is we optimize these uh, Serving of uh, apps used for uh, latency or throughput, depending on what the application is. If you have uh, uh, like cron job or something which has a lot of work to do in one burst, you can use uh, uh, the techniques to optimize for throughput. Or if you have real-time application where if, in which you just need to show the result right away to the to the user, you can optimize your serving for uh, latency. We have both these options available uh, in our pipeline. Um, to work on all these uh, cool things and a lot of other things like MapReduce, Spark, Recommender Systems, and a bunch of other things we are hiring. Uh, we are hiring especially for software developer roles as well as uh, data scientist roles. So yeah, if you want to, if you, if you, want to, if you are interested in working on these, uh, these things, you may check out this link, or you may get in touch with me on, uh, on LinkedIn, Twitter, or GitHub. Uh, I go by sahildua2305 name on mo most of the social media websites. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Sahil.
please raise your hand if you have a question. Hello, uh, thank you. So you use Kubernetes and you can scale up and scale down number of replicas, right? As you mentioned it. Uh, what do you use to decide whether you should scale up replicas or uh, scale down? Like what algorithm, what uh, is behind the load balancer? Do you do it ma uh, manually or automatically? Uh, I didn't understand your question. So what do we use as a metric to decide whether we want to? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like you have number of replicas, like five. Now you have load, and you want to decide if there should be uh, ten replicas or scale down. You know. Yeah. So Kubernetes out of the box provides a support to to, to to a few metrics like CPU usage, disk memory, as well as the traffic that we get like in the number of requests. So it really depends on the kind of application that we want, because uh, in some of the areas we want to. Uh, have the metric CPU uh, usage, which tells us how busy are our uh, CPUs on the particular container. Or we may also want to use the WSGI queue size. Because once we have a lot of requests coming to containers, we want to make sure that those uh, queues are not full. And once those queues are getting full, we want to con spawn more containers so that the traffic maybe uh, can be distributed so that the, those queues are not dropping off the request. So it really depends. Uh, uh, WSGI. Uh, queue size is one of the metrics that uh, we are looking at. OK, thanks. And my second question is, how do you annotate your data for uh, models, model training? Do you have some team of annotators, or how do you do it? Uh, your question is, uh, how do we come with this data? Or yeah, how do you annotate data, like the images? If you have some team of uh, annotators who draw, uh, this is bad, this is uh, chair, this is window. Oh yeah, okay. So we, so when we started writing this model for image uh, tagging, we hired some, we outsourced this uh, tagging manually. We had some uh, f f uh, huge number of images which were tagged manually by people, by humans, and uh, we used that kind of that data to train our model. And, and it, 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 it's some company, or how did you hire them? Sorry. Uh, it's some uh, external company that, that that has these annotators, or how you made it. Uh, your voice is not clear, sorry. Oh, I, I will come what after you listen. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so thank you very much for your talk. I think this is one of the main problems with Python and machine learning, deploying it. Um, I would be interested. If you want to use machine learning, you usually have to do some feature engineering, like you get some input data and then you have to crunch some numbers. Um, where do you actually do that? Do you do that in the app and you tell the app, okay, you have to provide this data? Or do you do that in the container? Or do you do it in on the Hadoop when the data comes in and you just kind of like send a pointer to that Hadoop data? Uh, yeah, so that that's something that I didn't cover. So what we do is we have some kind some kind of events data that is being logged in uh, in all the activities that we have on our website. And once we have the data, we have some Uzi workflows or cron jobs which take deal with that data and prepare that data to to the kind of data that we want to use in our models. So we have separate workflow which uh, takes care of the data merging and the uh, preparation of data basically for these models. I was wondering. I was wondering if you could uh, talk a little bit about how you iterate uh, with your models. And let's say I'm not sure whether that's the case, but if you have some new training data, you want to take it into account. You want to retrain your models and then check whether they're still performing well or not. Uh, how do you deal with these kind of things? Um, so, are you asking about how we deploy new models or the performance testing of new models? Uh, both. Uh, okay. So once we know that we have new models, we want uh, data scientists want to update the model. What we do is we have some particular. Uh, so we use OpenShift on the top of Kubernetes to manage the <coughs> graphic interface of uh, the entire structure. Uh, so once we know that there is a new model, we have uh, we we update our deployment with that new model, and we can use A/B testing to 
to, to see how, what kind of results we get, and we have proper monitoring, which tells us how, what's the distribution of, uh, of our feature sets, what's the distribution of our outputs for a particular model, and we can use that information to, to decide whether the model is good or not, whether we want to keep it or move to the previous version. In your, in your talk that you, one of the ways to uh, improve throughput and latin latency was to uh, cache or to have a, a, a hash table of pre previous predictions. How do you implement that uh, per container or do you have a centralized and what technology do you use for that? Um, so the thing that I mentioned for, uh, for caching and uh, keeping the predictions in the in the lookup tables, that is something that de really depends on your use case. Uh, so we, honestly, we haven't f found out that kind of use case where we already know what kind of uh, predictions we are going to predict. So what we do is we don't use uh, the lookup tables, but we predict in the real time. So we use the other kind of techniques that I mentioned uh, to optimize for latency as well as throughput. So we don't uh, already have some application where we, can, we could employ the lookup tables. Okay, so that's it. Uh, thank you, Sahil. Uh, thank you. Please give a warm round of applause to Sahil.